Come out with us and play Love Your London. Have a banana. It's been a while, hasn't it? We're really sorry about our four-month hiatus. Uh, we have, of course, refunded our patrons throughout this period, and thank you for sticking with us. In this episode of Love Your London, we will be showing you some more of the area's rich musical heritage, where rock stars and pop stars brush shoulders. Take a leisurely walk alongside the river, telling you about interesting facts along the way, and we'll be checking out Barnes Village itself, with its quaint pubs and villagey atmosphere. But first, let's pop on into the London Wetland Centre. Hello and welcome to episode two of our fantastic new series on Barnes to Mortlake. Uh, we are outside the WWT London Wetland Centre. Now WWT stands for the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust and there are 10 WWT nature reserves in the UK but this is the only one in London. There are of course loads of other wetland centres in London but this is the only WWT one and it was actually voted in 2012 as, as Britain's favourite nature reserve and it is here and uh, really looking forward to going in i can't wait um it's got otters it's got butterflies it's got uh roundhouse. It's, yes it's got a roundhouse it has um loads of birds um it, there's about 80 water voles here as well which is a creature that's not doing very well in the uk anymore um because about 95 percent of their natural habitat has disappeared um and so there's a big just going to clean my feet for bird flu yeah. um there's a there, there's a hope that maybe um well because 95 percent of water voles natural population um has disappeared so they're hoping that with these 80 uh, around 80 water voles that are living here at the wetland center that um, hopefully this, this is a, they might be able to rewild them a bit and sort of like bring the water voles back here because they're such an important uh, they're, 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 they're the um, they're the uh, they're such an important animal they are the UK's fastest declining mammal um, now this place uh, was um, actually man-made it was it um, it's reusing four disused Victorian reservoirs and it measures just under 30 hectares in fact 29.9 hectares to be precise and uh, we were talking about uh, Sir David Attenborough uh, in the in the last episode because uh, we we talked about how he found the skull of um, of Mrs. Thomas in his uh, in in the pub garden that he had bought for redeveloping in 2009. If you haven't seen that episode yet, um, just look up there, and there's going to be a little link in the corner, um, and you can watch that first. Or you, it doesn't matter. You can watch this first and the other one afterwards. It doesn't really matter. But if you want to watch them in order, then watch episode one first. That makes more sense. Um, but yes, so David Attenborough actually opened this facility in the year 2000. Um, and there he is, the man himself, uh, the lovely little statue of him just behind me, uh, looking, looking busy and... OK, well, I'm just going to stop you there because what we're doing is we're going to be doing a very special episode for our patrons only all about the wetland centre. It's going to be very leisurely paced and we're going to be recommending that you wear earphones for it because there will be lots of slow takes showing the wetland centre in all its beauty and it'll be in full stereo. In fact, there's hardly any talking in it at all. It's really all about the serene environment. So it just didn't seem right to include it in one of our usual chatty episodes. We did the full circuit. We went to the Duck Hotel, where new arrivals adapt to their new surroundings, where Magda told us all about their Cape Barren geese, who were slowly getting acclimatised to the British weather. We see an awful lot of birds, the occasional bovine, a glimpse of an otter, and quite a lot of aeroplanes too. Tickets, inclusive of gift aid, are £17 per person, £11 for children, and £15.30 for concessions. There are family deals too, but you'll need to be a patron to view the full episode, which will be coming out in the next few weeks. Of course, there's lots of ways you can support us. Just subscribing to our channel is a great start and costs nothing. And do ring that notification bell.
Like this video as well? However, sharing our videos on your own social media is the most helpful thing you could do, because we do put an awful lot of work into each episode. And uh, do feel free to ask us any questions in the comment section. OK, back to episode two. We're starting out outside the Olympic Studios, which is currently a cinema and a cafe. And it started off actually as a cinema. When I say cinema, it, was, it, was, it sort of started off as a theatre, but it had something in there called a bioscope. Um, now, the word bioscope is... Uh, it's basically it's a very very early form of cinema because this building was was built in 1906 and as you can see it's called the Byfeld Hall um, and so it opened in 1906 and it opened as a theater but with a bioscope now bioscope is like a traveling projector it's a very very early form of cinema um, back you know, in the very early 1900s they would use these uh, to travel in fact the word bioscope um, it's still used today, uh, to this day, among the older generation in uh, South Africa, in Afrikaans, bioscope. Uh, bioscope is, um, uh, means, uh, well, it means theatre. Uh, in fact, in Dutch, it's still used in Serbian, uh, bioscope. Still used today, that, that is the current Serbian word for, for cinema. Um, but anyway, so this was uh, this had a cinema or a bioscope in it, and the bioscope would show very very short projections of films, uh, and then there'd be some dancing girls, and then there'd be another short film, and then some dancing girls, etc. Uh, but then in 1966, um, Olympic Studios moved here. They were already a recording company, um, and the very first. Um, the very first session that they recorded was with the Rolling Stones, no less. Um, they were... The Rolling Stones. Yes, they were the very first people uh, to, uh, to record in this, when it was a recording studio. I bumped into Ronnie Woodley a little while ago. Oh, uh, do you don't mind telling us about that, do you? He, 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 you bumped into Ronnie Wood? In, sp in spite of popular belief, he's sharp as a razor. Yeah, 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 fantastic. Oh, well, and how, where was he? What was he doing? Oh, I, I, I had to drop something off to him at his house. Ah, oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, so, That's yeah, and he, he was putting me correct straight on dates of the concerts that he'd uh, done. You know, right. where I said it was one, and he said, no, it wasn't, it was this a date, and, and yeah. then, right, right, okay, yeah. Oh, fantastic. And he's a nice bloke, and I know that he grew up on the barge community out in West Drayton, because I live out that way. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. West Drayton. And, and, and I, I remember reading a book a long time ago, and it was saying about before they was anybody. Yeah. Uh, um, what's his name? Um, what's the other fella's name? The crazy one. Mick Jagger? No, not Mick Jagger. Uh, Keith Richards? Keith Richards. There was a bit in there where they were doing a gig at the church, local church hall in Usley, West Drayton. Yeah. And, and uh, Keith was ca taking his amp down the road to the church in a wheelbarrow. In a, in a, in a, in a, in a wheelbarrow. So oh, how things have changed. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, that's our card. What was your name? Uh, oh, Ray. Ray, nice to meet you. We, we, you? We, do, we do little shows about London, about oh, music and stuff. So oh, right, off okay. YouTube. Okay. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Thanks Ray. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's a nice fortuitous moment there. Uh, someone who actually knew Rolling Stones, or knew, uh, who bumped into Ronnie Wood. The Rolling Stones ended up recording six of their albums here, and if you are curious to see what the Olympic Studios looked like in the 1960s, check out the breathtakingly wonderful Sympathy for the Devil movie, originally directed by Jean-Luc Godard, but more recently repackaged by Mim Scala for ABK Co Films. There is a link to this original snippet in the description, and it's wonderful to see how it looked like from inside, and of course, to see Brian Jones there too. You can watch the movie on Apple TV, at the moment, or you can buy the physical DVD or Blu-ray from Amazon and elsewhere. All links are in the YouTube description. Um, so loads of film scores, countless ones actually were recorded here. Some include um, the Rocky, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, The Life of Brian, uh, The Italian Job. They're, all those scores were were filmed in here in these studios, and. Uh, 
David Bowie recorded Diamond Dogs here, or, or most of it anyway, not the whole thing, but um, yeah, I mean, so many important albums, seminal albums have been recorded uh, here, right here, when it was Olympic Studios. Uh, after, after a while, Olympic Studios was bought by Virgin. The, the woman in charge of, um, of the new studios, the new Virgin Studios, I think her name was Barbara Jeffries, um, she, uh, she just like, there were all these like master tapes and stuff in there and she said, oh we don't want any of them, she just chucked them in the skip out here on the road. The skip was here about three or four days and it was absolutely full of master tapes and important recordings, she just threw them away. Uh, word did get out, obviously not as fast as it would do these days with social media, we're talking about 1987 here, um, but word got out and um, uh, loads of fans started like grabbing what they could, not everything though, but uh, they grabbed quite a few important masters of recording sessions and stuff and whatever, and they turned out to be um, bootleg, valuable bootlegs that uh, ended up being worth loads loads of money that were sold in Camden Market and all places like that and various record shops. Obviously bootlegs are not legal but if it, if it weren't for, for finding them these things would have been completely lost because of um, that silly lady uh, Barbara Jeffries. It was also actually here where Martin Glover, better known as Youth, worked in the 1990s and where Simon Posford, later part of Spongel, also worked. Youth went on to start Butterfly Studios, poaching Simon and taking him along with him, where they put together one of our favourite albums, Twisted, by Hallucinogen. It became a cinema again in 2013, but there is still a very small recording studio in there. And some of the original staff are actually working in that recording studio as well. But now, let me show you something just across the road. Here we have... Olympic Studios Records. Just here across the road. It's owned by the Olympic Studios. Um, and it is a fantastic record shop. It is somewhere where all the local people of Barnes can take their records and bring them here and, and apparently they give them really decent prices as well. Um, they are trying to get hold of all the original uh, Olympic recordings. Um, there are, they've managed to get hold of 875 of the 1,075 albums that were originally recorded and or mixed at Olympic Studios opposite. Um, and um, this place also sells vintage vinyl as well as re-releasing old Olympic recordings. It's only open three days a week, two till five on Fridays, ten till five on Saturdays and two till five on Sundays. It's closed the rest of the week and obviously uh, today being Monday it's closed. Um, they do have a small online shop on Discogs, you can find the link in the description below but don't expect to pay anything less than three figures for anything. I mean you know they've got some, they've got uh, original copies of Revolver um, by the Beatles, all that sort of stuff. I mean, you, there's some there's some great stuff. There's not a very large collection on Discogs. I think they want most people to come in here and, and browse and talk to the specialists. Um, now, um, one very interesting thing about Barnes uh, is that um, uh, in 2014, the survey discovered that Barnes has the highest proportion of um, independent shops anywhere in the whole of the UK. A whopping 96.6% of shops in Barnes are independent. That's amazing. 96.6% of shops are, are independent here. Um, and you'll see, you know, there's not very many chains, apart from your Sainsbury's and stuff like that, but there aren't very many chains. It's, uh, they're all um, lovely independent shops, which is absolutely wonderful to see. Um, and it's one of the things that makes Barnes really special, really villagey, really different. Yes, here we have um, Iron Mongers Muse. There's so many, so many um, people who, uh, who, who, I mean, there are lots of professions here uh, in Barnes and Mortlake. Uh, we'll be talking about them later on in the episode, but there were Coopers, there were Iron Mongers, there were Potteries, um, there, was, there were Brewers until quite recently. Look at these lovely old streets as well. Um, that used to be a restaurant, I'm sure there was a restaurant here once. Pretty sure there was. It was like a nice sort of like cantina thing. 
No, I wasn't going crazy. This is where the Courtyard Café used to be, not that long ago, and it was also known as the Caravan Café because it was attached to a now long-gone interior design shop called Caravan Interiors. Why am I telling you all this? Well, the funny thing about Ironmonger's Row, and indeed Church Row Passage, which it joins onto, is that their names do not appear at all on Google Maps. And another thing you'll notice, if I try and bring the little man down on, onto the map, um, it's that uh, none of this area has ever been covered by the Google Streetcar, not even the uh, the main road outside, which must have been really frustrating for all the businesses that used to be here. Now you'll notice on the map all these little circles, those are photospheres that the businesses added to the Google coverage, and thank goodness they did, or else we'd have no idea of what this area used to look like. The businesses have gone, but the photospheres thankfully still remain. As for why the road names don't appear on Google, please let us know in the comment section. Um, anyway, so we're now going to, um, we've just been talking about Olympic Studios, um, so we're now going to uh, talk about a pub just over there called the Red Lion, on Castle now. It's a, a pub where Jimi Hendrix uh, would go after recording sessions here in the Olympic Studios, he would go with the Jimi Hendrix experience and get sozzled at the Red Lion. Um, so it's a pub with a music history. Um, now it's just a very beautiful old pub. Um, but uh, wow, I mean, the, the stories of that place probably um, must tell. I mean, obviously, it's so close to Olympic Studios, so all the people who record in there you know they want to drink afterwards i'm sure most of them end up there i mean so many people have recorded uh, you know even in more modern times madonna the spice girls um 808 state i mean so many so many people have uh, have recorded in there and i'm sure they a lot of them ended up there in the red line i mean wouldn't you just just look at that doesn't that look lovely okay so now i'm going to talk to you a little bit about these oars um, now, this is the one that's opposite the Red Lion, and oars are very important to this neck of the woods. Uh, this is the Barnes Village Trail, um, and you may want to take this route yourself. Uh, we're going to be doing a different route. We've done our own research, um, but um, if you wanted to do a, a route and discover maybe things that we're not covering, then by all means take the Barnes Village Trail, and you can use this QR code, which gives you information as you walk around uh, Barnes Village and discover things that you may be interested in. Um, so you'll see these dotted around all over the place and also in the ground you'll see the odd sort of like silver disc which sort of like tell, tells you which direction to go. So we're on Castle now. Uh, it's an interesting name, Castle now or Castle now. No one's really quite sure how to pronounce it. Uh, well, I know how to pronounce it uh, because it comes from Occitan. Um, Oh, and uh, Castle now means um, uh, Newcastle, um, as in Newcastle, and um, uh, it's actually named after the 10th Baron of Castle now, who was uh, a Huguenot, uh, who was escaped France for reasons, probably affectation or whatever, for reasons that, um, that just, it just happens that the locals nowadays call it Castle Nor. It's not called Castle Nor, it's Castle Now, but uh, there you go, uh, just an affectation, you know, like they um, just, just want, to, want to sound a little bit different, I guess, but uh, they're wrong, it's Castle Now, that's the original Occitan pronunciation, and uh, anyway, so we're now going to go up Ferry Road, we're going to head up to number 40 Ferry Road, in the summer of 69! Yes, we're at number 40 Ferry Road. And no, this house has nothing to do with Brian Adams, but it does have something to do with the summer of 69, and it does have something to do with another Brian. Because it is here, in the summer of 69, very briefly, that three members of Queen lived. Brian May, that's the Brian connection, Freddie Mercury, and Roger Taylor. Um, they lived here, obviously, um, in the uh, first episode on this series, uh, we visited the current house of John Deacon. Uh, John Deacon obviously did not uh, live in this house, it was just the other three, but although they were here for only a very, very short time, it is a very important house in the history of Queen, because it is here where 
they came up with the name Queen. Hello. Hello. Well, do you live here? You live here? I do. According to neighbours who've lived here for a long time, the place was, the downstairs was just like a squat. Right. You know? And then there was a lady who owned the house who was living on the first floor. Yeah. And then the top floor was lived in by somebody else. But the place, because we, we had work done to it. Yeah. And um, the place had just been bolted, you know, bits yeah. been bolted on, bits here and there. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, we've changed it completely. Just around the corner from here, um, Brian May, um, this is much later on, went after he married his first wife, Chrissy Mullen. Um, they moved just literally down around the corner from where Queen used to live, and they came up with the name Queen, here on Suffolk Road. Uh, he doesn't live there anymore, and he was here until not that long ago. Um, it is number 54 Suffolk Road. Mm. Really? Mm. Wow. Who'd have thought they'd ever really grow here like that? I, you know, that's really something special. Mm. Go on, they're so sweet. No thanks. Hi. No, I really don't. I'm not. I'm feeling not not feeling that at all. I'll, try I'll just smell it. No, no thanks. Mm. It's fine. It's fine. I'm, I'm not. Guys, a the nicest, I nicest. like them. I like them when they're they're potted. That is the nicest I've had. Yeah. So we uh, and we just showed you uh, just now where Brian May moved with his wife Chrissy Mullen um, just after he married. Well, this is where they married uh, here at the Catholic Church of St Osmond Barnes. Um, they got married on the 29th of May 1976 in this very church. We're at number 79 Castle now. We're back on Castle now. There's a couple more places to show you on Castle now down there before we leave this interesting little street. So in our first episode of the series we showed you the tragic site where Mark Bolan lost his life in a terrific car accident. Um, this unfortunately is not the only uh, accident to happen to a famous um, member of the music community. I'm afraid this here number 93 Castell now is where Sandy Denny, the singer of uh, Fairport Convention, um, she, she fell and she, she ended up in a coma uh, from which she never woke up. Uh, she was absolutely distraught. Uh, she just, um, she, her, her husband Trevor had uh, run off to Australia with, uh, with their child uh, without telling her. Uh, she was absolutely distraught, um, so this was actually a friend of hers who was looking after her. She'd fallen down a few times uh, before, uh, so she was just looking, making sure that she was okay, and unfortunately she had an accident here, fell over, and went into a coma and never ever recovered. The singer of Fairport Convention, Sandy Denny. Very, very sad story. Okay, so we're just approaching number 201 Castle now, although technically it's now called 1B Lonsdale Road because they sort of like changed the, uh, changed the, uh, the, the main address. It is now Bright Horizons Barnes Day Nursery and Preschool. It used to be a fantastic place covered with ivy. Uh, just, just, you could barely see it, it was just like ivy everywhere. It's now they've clear, clean, cleaned it up, it doesn't look very nice at all, does it? But anyway, um, this wasn't a nursery, there's not a reason I'm talking, telling you about this, it's because it's a nursery. This used to be a restaurant. Um, it's, had, it's, had, it's had a few reincarnations over the years. Um, it uh, was most recently called L'Olivo Italiano, but back in 1983 it was known as the Old Rangoon Restaurant. So in our recent episodes on Barkingside and Fairlop, we uh, we visited the home, or the rough environs of the home, of uh, former Eurovision singer Kathy Kirby, um, whose song uh, Secret Love, which was a a cover version of the Doris Day classic uh, was recorded using Jimmy Page as a backing guitarist. Jimmy Page, of course, from Led Zeppelin. It was here when this was called the Old Rangoon Restaurant, where Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin threw a real hissy fit. He was a real diva. Um, and it was quite a notorious moment. Uh, he was in here having a nice lunch and dinner with the journalist, John Blake, and uh, his, um, his hissy fit really went down in music history. He ended up having a huge row with John Blake about something or other. 
and I'm going to quote from my notes here because I want to get this absolutely right uh, he, he threw a glass of wine over John Blake in front of all the other people all the other diners in, in, in the restaurant and shouted at him you are the scum of the earth kneel down before me and apologize so that's uh, that's what he said and this restaurant is really this is what it's most famous for uh, that particular moment in time in 1983 when Jimmy Page threw a hissy fit at a famous journalist see we are an educational channel okay so we are here at what is now called Harrods Village um, and uh, if you just have I probably can have a better look at it from here look at these amazing buildings this is grade two listed of course um, and uh, this is uh, all part of a massive residential estate which was completed in the year 2000 250 townhouses and penthouse suites costing an absolute fortune um, so why is it called Harrods well if we just come a little bit further this way uh, we are, this is a very this is the gated community so we won't be able to get very far but if you just stand here you'll see the words Harrods Furniture Depository um, now it's obviously a very very famous uh, landmark for rowing fans because it is a key marker post on the annual Oxford and Cambridge boat race the Harrods Furniture Depository although normally we see it from the other side from the riverside which we'll be having a look at in a moment uh, so this place was built uh, in 1894 as a place for uh, Harrods to keep items that were far too large uh, to fit in their store so you know like massive big stuffed giraffes and all sorts of stuff uh, pillars all all things like that that they used to keep in there um, and uh, and this is where they kept it and obviously it was uh, then sold for development by Mohammed Al Fayed uh, eventually um, and uh, but this was uh, then turned into obviously what was it turned into luxury flats yes very very luxury in this in these cases anyway i'm pretty sure we're not going to be able to walk through there so we're going to have to do a bit of a dog leg which is going to add an extra five minutes onto our journey because these people don't really like oh. people like us walking through their land with a camera uh, but uh, we, it does mean that we'll get to see uh, see it nicely from the front uh, which we'll show you now there you go, Furniture Harrods Depository. Not the best of view, really, because we're a bit very close to it. We're right now above on the towpath. Um, however, um, here's a little bit of a, here's a little bit of a, a stock photo here, which I can slip in for you to see it. And it's all in all its glory. It's a very famous landmark. We're now going to have a little walk down here. Where yeah. next stop is the Hammersmith Bridge. Look at the blackberries. That's got to be one of the biggest crops. <laughs> I've seen them here in a while. Yeah. I'm not Well, um, I think that gives you oh, that gives you a very good idea. It's all those those exhausted um, four rowers who just passed by. This is obviously the end of their little training. Um, they're actually uh, not rowing the direction that the Oxford and Cambridge boat race would go, or the boat race. It's just so famous. It's just known as the boat race. Uh, they're going in the direction that the head of the river would go, which is another competition, which is. Uh, um, from Mortlake to Putney because the boat race goes from Putney to Mortlake upriver uh, they're going that way where they go they're heading out towards the east um, and yes they look quite exhausted so yes this is the famous course the Harrods Furniture Depository is a, a famous landmark on, on the way another one is we're coming up to at the moment that's Hammersmith Bridge it's mired in controversy at the moment 
uh, because of inaction about how to reopen it to cars or whether they should reopen it to cars. Anyway, I'm going to tell you all about it when we're next to it. Okay, so behind me, there it is, Hammersmith Bridge. Famous bridge. Um, it's a uh, it's a very famous and very beautiful grade two star listed Hammersmith Bridge. Uh, the it was well, th it wasn't this one, but uh, in its right here was the very first suspension bridge to be built on the Thames, which was built between 1825 and 1827. But it wasn't built to support the weight of heavy traffic. So in 1870, the owners were very concerned to see some 12,000 people on top of it watching the boat race go by, and they thought, oh gosh, 12,000 people, we can't have that. Uh, it's not going to stand that, I mean, even though, so, so they, they, they knocked it down and they built a new bridge uh, a few years later, in eight, between 1884 and 1887, Sir Joseph Bazalgette designed this bridge. Um, but unfortunately there have been structural problems with it for years. The tower bearings on this side of the bridge actually failed in 1983 and had to be replaced. Uh, they actually closed it in 1997 to all cars for a year while they did more work on it and then they reopened it in 1998 with various weight restrictions. For example there were um, traffic lights put in to make sure that uh, not too many buses were on the bridge at any one time and the routes that had to take that uh, bridge, the double-decker buses, had to be replaced with single-deckers in order to, uh, to, to cope with, uh, with, with uh, the weight. But in 2019 it was closed to all road traffic and in 2020 it was closed to pedestrians as well. Um, now of course local residents were fuming um, and on Valentine's Day on the 14th of February 2021 they got together to light the bridge up in scarlet and displayed a message reading broken hearts, broken promises, broken lives, broken bridges. Uh, and in, in July 2021 it did reopen to pedestrians and cyclists only. Uh, but it is unlikely um, to ever open again to vehicles. If it does, this definitely won't happen until uh, 2027 at the very, very earliest. Um, and there has been an agreement in place that in order to pay for this, um, they, will, they will actually have a toll charge so that vehicles will have to pay three pounds to cross the bridge if they want to cross it. And that will hopefully keep the traffic down. Uh, obviously, vehicles already have to pay ULES charges if they're, if they're um, polluting vehicles, um, congestion charges, obviously, if they're in the centre of London. Um, but, uh, but this will be an extra charge, an extra £3. It'll probably end up much more than £3 um, if it even goes ahead. But uh, the, the, the likelihood is that it probably won't go ahead and it will stay just for cyclists and pedestrians because it just isn't strong enough. Um, now, there are a lot of complaints about this. I mean, uh, the, this here, as you can see on your screen, is a, is a, is a poster that was put up in, in front of someone's house around the corner complaining about, uh, about, the, uh, about this. Uh, because they're just sick and tired of, uh, of not having a bridge that they can drive over and they live in here and they have to drive all the way to other places of London. It just causes a lot of extra congestion and, and hassle. Yeah, so three pounds to, to cross that bridge. That's probably what they're going to be charging cars. Now, three pounds, you can become a patron uh, by Patreon. Um, that's one of our little tiers, uh, the lowest tier, three pounds a month. Um, that helps us really, it helps us with transport, it helps us being able to do these things and, uh, and bring this information to you because we are an educational channel um, and um, uh, you don't have to um, pay money, you can help us for free uh, by sharing these videos, share them loads, share them everywhere on all your social media, uh, in groups that you might think would be interested in them, on Reddit, whatever. Um, and, uh, and also um, like these videos, subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already, it doesn't cost you a thing, and hit that notification bell, comment in the comments below because that sort of thing the YouTube algorithms really like. But anyway, let's carry on walking down this lovely river and see what else we can see.
there's, there's the, uh, we're looking across the river to the Middlesex side. There's the Dove and lots and lots of rowing clubs over there. That, I do believe, is the Sons of the Thames, which my dad helped save. He was, he was sort of like, he, he was running it for a while uh, and he rowed for them and for the River Lee and lots of other places. Yeah, this is a boathouse, I think, for St John's School, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is for, for young kids. Uh, but that one here, my dad was a rowing coach um, and now lives in Spain. And I believe that was Sons of the Thames, one of the places that he uh, used to row for and, and, and uh, then coach. And yeah, he, the sun is sinking I, in the west northwest. He, he won the Wifel Challenge Cup, I believe, at Henley. Yes, it's lovely. This is absolutely lovely. Yes, and that's a lovely little pub there, the old ship. <sighs> Going to be looking forward to exploring that area again when we cover that side of the river at some point. There we go. <sighs> Peeking through the bushes. Ah, they're turning. That might be that might be their indicator some sort of indicator that over there that's the that's the halfway post that is the halfway mark of its 6779 meter course um and uh yes as you can see we're, we're opposite the old ship pub in hammersmith so the the boat race has been running since 1829 um, as I said earlier, it starts at Putney Bridge and it ends just before Chiswick Bridge in Mortlake. Uh, the men's race has been won 86 times by Cambridge, 81 times by Oxford and one dead heat in 1877. Talking about these markers, um, <coughs> there's, there was the, there's the one mile post further back there. Uh, we didn't cover it because we're uh, that's sort of like more towards Putney. We're going to be saving that for when we do Putney. Um, but uh, it's quite near the London River Club that we talked about earlier, um, where Ebenezer Cobb Morley uh, used, to, used to row. Um, and he was rowing right up until his 80s. Uh, but yes, so the one mile post is quite important uh, because uh, there is a memorial to Steve Fairbairn, who is an Australian rower who rowed the boat race for Cambridge in 1882, 1883, 1886 and 1887. Now that's quite unusual, but that's because he ended up doing a PhD uh, at Cambridge, so that's why he uh, returned. Um, but he's most famous for founding another famous race that I mentioned earlier uh, that's been taking place here since 1925 and that is called the Head of the River and that takes place a couple of weeks before the Oxford and Cambridge boat race but as I said earlier it goes the other way it uh, goes from Mortlake to Putney. What is also quite different about it is uh, unlike normal other races it's actually a race against the clock I've actually gone to see it a friend of mine Sophie uh, was rowing for Leander uh, at one point and she did very well um, but uh, yes so um, it was a race against the clock and so basically they're all timed and uh, it's really really interesting there's loads and loads of um practice makes perfect yep yeah. This race against the clock style is known as processional rowing um, and uh, I believe my dad has actually raced in that one as well. I'm pretty sure he has. The, um, the, the head of the river, as I said, it, it goes the other way and uh, that was started by Steve Fairburn. He was uh, quite a famous coach. He, I, I believe he was one of the um, first rowers to sort of like suggesting coaching that uh, you should push yourself back uh, sort of like it, it like like a movable 
I don't know if it's like a movable seat, but it cheers your legs much more to go back. And he was sort of like developed that whole technique, which uh, obviously took on. It's how, how people rode today. Look at that, even more exhausted rowers on the river. Terrific day. It's a lovely day. It's a lovely day. Yeah. Lovely. It's just boat after boat after boat, isn't it? And it's not. It's, uh, oh, that over there. I see that little eight over there. Uh, when I say eight, I'm not talking about an eight, uh, as in uh, as in eight rowers. I'm talking about that island right over there. Uh, that's actually spelt eight. It's actually spelt E Y O T T, I believe. Eight. It looks like, uh, but you pronounce it eight. Uh, and I think that's called Chiswick eight, if I'm not mistaken. E Y O T is the normal spelling, but you pronounce it eight. Chiswick eight. A little island. Apparently, the, apparently the uh, the water gets quite rough around there sometimes, uh, depending on whether the tide is or in or out. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting place. Let's carry on walking down towards glorious, our glorious next destination. Green, glorious green little trail that we have. Okay, so here we are. We're at something called the Lego Mutton Reservoir. Lego Mutton Reservoir. Now I'm going to, uh, probably so you get a rough idea of what this is all about, if, uh, if I'm going to show you a bit of uh, Google Earth here, uh, soar over it, you can see the road there that we were going down, the, the, the towpath. We've just uh, then taken a left going down towards Lonsdale Road. Um, and so here between the two is this reservoir. It's really extraordinary. There's like the big river and then the reservoir and then the road. Uh, Lego Mutton Reservoir. Um, as you now, was it called Lego Mutton? Well, if you can have a look, you probably saw on Google Earth just now. But if you see also that map over there, you'll see it is in the shape of a leg of mutton. Um, if you don't know what a leg of mutton looks like, here's an example for you. Um, but um, it's uh, yes, I mean the word leg of mutton is actually used for shapes, also in clothes design and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, it's um, it's a strange name really because. Um, why is it leg o mutton? You know, it sounds, it sounds a bit like filet o fish, doesn't it? Or like, well, there's, there's no reason why it's o apostrophe. No one, I've not been able to find a reason. I've looked, probably spent a couple of hours last night looking, couldn't find a reason, but there you go. Uh, if you do know, just let us know in the comments. So why is it leg o mutton? Um, but yes, um, now we can't go in there. It's probably, probably they've shut it because it's too late. But also there has been a uh, bird flu detected in here. So they don't want the people to spread it. Um, um, they want people to stick to the paths and obviously when it gets dark you can't really see where you're going so that's probably why it's closed uh, but yes this is a reservoir it's called a reservoir it's no longer actually technically a reservoir it was built in 1838 for Thames water and it contains over 260,000 cubic meters of water and it used to supply local water until 1960 when it was decommissioned now Believe it or not, and this is quite uh, un unbelievable, but believe it or not, they were going to drain this and turn it into flats, into residential areas. Uh, they're going to drain this, this uh, amazing commodity. Um, Fortunately, the local residents uh, were absolutely outraged. They complained to say, do not do this. And they listened. And so it remained not a drinking reservoir, but it eventually in 1990 became a nature reserve another nature reserve and it's full of some interesting species of uh, animals and whatnot unfortunately um, it's getting late but also um i guess uh, you know bird flu has been detected in this area as well so yeah oh look there's someone in there how did no, he get here just leaving. oh just leaving yeah oh well all right actually that man who we just saw he just he just came out of here so it wasn't actually closed uh, at all I, I, that's happened to me hey i wasn't it wasn't closed at all it's so we lift, so we slide. can yeah we can we can come in here so we're, uh, gonna have a quick look. we're just gonna have a very quick look because i don't want to spend too long unless there is another exit this side is there another exit yes there's another exit so we can actually oh, stay we'll just walk straight across yes there it is the leg of mutton well oh, we we are walking that side uh, that's it yeah so um that's, that's quite nice uh, we it was open all along uh, we won't we'll be careful not to spread bird flu but anyway let's uh, have a little look at this reservoir which almost was turned into flats <sighs> look at that there it is a leg of mutton. 
Leg O Mutton. Leg O Mutton, come on. <sighs> Uh, now, uh, just uh, just over here to our left, well, not just yet, but we'll be passing it in a moment, there's a, quite an exclusive school. Um, it's got a very exclusive sounding name. It's, it's the Herodian School. The Herodian School. H-A-R-R-O-D-I-A-N. Sounds very old, doesn't it? Sounds almost like something to do with Harrow, maybe. Uh, but it's not. It's actually... It's actually more connected with Harrods rather than Harrow. Now you see, um, it used to be the Harrodian Club, uh, which was a clubhouse and a sports ground for employees at Harrods. But in 1988, Mohammed Al Fayed sold the ground and it became a school in 1993. And the school kept the name, the Herodian School, because it sounded old and, of course, as I said, it sounded a bit like Harrow. Uh, Old Al Fayed, he wasn't very happy about that at all, about the fact he sold them the ground, he hadn't sold them the name, so he actually sued them, tried, took them to court. Uh, I don't actually blame him, to be honest. I mean, he, he was just selling, you know, he had a place called the Herodian Club, wasn't expecting the school to be called the Herodian School, so actually he had a point. He, 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 I, I do actually agree with him on this one. Anyway, so it's quite an expensive school. Uh, it costs about £17,000 a year for primary school children from age 4.5 to 7 and it rises to about £25,000 a year for sixth form. But on top of that you've got insurance, you've got lunch, and so add a couple of grand more on um, per year. Um, but as I said, it's not an old school, uh, so it's not been there very long. Um, not a huge list of famous students to have been there. Um, because after all, as I said, it's only been a school since 1993. Probably the most famous is Robert Pattinson, um, the actor. He would be termed an old Herodian. It makes it look as if the school is far older than it really is. But, uh, it's an absolutely beautiful building. Um, and to think, uh, I mean, to, you know, whatever you think of Al Fayed and, uh, and, and, and whatever, um, if, if the members of staff were, had this as their facility uh, in order to, uh, for, for them to have the, a social life, I mean, there was, uh, there was, there was sports facilities, so it was, it, was a, a, it was just for the staff at Howard's. Well, I mean, that's amazing. That's pretty, um, that's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Beautiful grounds, huge big place, lots of facilities, probably lots of parties. And now it's a school that has robbed the name. Mm. I say I'm with Mohammed Al Fayed on this one. No wonder he was angry. <sighs> anyway, let's carry on walking down Lonsdale Road to the next place. We've got another famous house where someone lived. And we've got a few bars to look at, a few pubs. Really, some really lovely pubs, by the way. Okay, so uh, we are we are on. There's a there's a Thames. So you've got the Emmanuel School Boat Club just across the river. Uh, that over there is Barnes Railway Bridge, but we'll be talking about that in the next episode. So I'm not going to go into that right now. Just wanted to show you uh, here number ten, the terrace. Uh, Gustav Holtz, composer. Uh, 1874 to 1934. He lived here from 1908 to 1913 for, you know, just uh, five years, but that's his uh, blue plaque. Um, he, these, these houses on the terrace, they're actually, um, most of them were built for, uh, for watermen. I believe um, 
uh, I have an ancestor many many centuries ago who was a water boatman uh, ferrying people across the Thames maybe he even lived in one of these these houses they got um, they were really used just in the summer because this would get so damp in the winter that they would actually be unlivable um, and um, and also they'd be prone to flooding as well uh, quite often you know before this this wall was built and whatnot I'm not gonna trust oh, uh, he's upside down but yeah let's see yes look at look at that down there you've got no, somebody's put in some effort isn't that nice yeah okay oh. Yes, now look at look at look at this, and and in fact you see this here. These uh, you see this here. This this wall. Uh, this uh, would have been added to uh, help uh, prevent any flooding. This was like an extra level of protection. These places flooded quite often. Um, this wall was not that the wall that it is now. Uh, but as I said, these places used mainly for for watermen. Right, so now we're, this is, we're sort of really entering Barnes Village proper now. Uh, this is just pub after pub, it's amazing. You've got the Waterman's Arms right next to the Bull's Head. Um, now, the Bull's Head is a really good pub for jazz. Uh, it uh, has jazz three times a week, sometimes four times a week. Um, it's around about £15 uh, to watch a good jazz act, although on Monday nights, I believe. Tonight is a Monday, but I, we haven't really got time for it. If you are on a budget, then obviously, and if you can play an instrument, then good time to come. It's Monday night and you get in for free. I want to just show you very briefly all the pubs that are, that are, that are around here. Just want to double check. Is it a jam session tonight? It isn't tonight. tonight oh, okay. Because the band we have normally, the house band, are performing on Thursday. Right. So, unfortunately, they're. Oh, that's a shame. They're rehearsing for a few days. And then oh, right. Okay, we'll have to go somewhere else then. Sorry about that. Do you want to have a quick look around? We, 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 we've, uh, we've, we've got a YouTube channel. We're, we're talking about uh, pubs and stuff around here. Yeah, perfect. Lovely. Thank, Thank you. And this is the jazz room, the jazz room and loose. There you go. It's a shame, shame there's no one here tonight, but uh, there you go, girls and boys. And that's where it all happens in the jazz club, but it's not on tonight. Apparently, that's, uh, I thought it would happen. I thought it was going to be happening tonight, Monday night, but no jam session. <laughs> Lovely, isn't it? And look at this, another pub right next door. And the little street, are they going left on the high street? Ah, and this pub does not. This looks like an ex pub. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's not going to be turning into luxury flats. Yeah, so just, just over the road from that uh, jazz place, we have the Coach and Horses. Uh, this is another great little pub. It looks quite small, but actually it's got the largest beer garden in the whole of Barnes, according to them anyway. It's not that cheap, unfortunately. They do have um, their Burger Shack menu, which we're going to come to in a moment. It's a little bit pricey. Uh, for example, a hot dog is £12.50, uh, but that doesn't include loaded fries, which are another £7. Um, but the burgers are meant to be fantastic. But yes, here is the amazing, uh, as you can see, amazing uh, beer garden. It's really lovely, isn't it? Look at this. And it's dog friendly. You'll find that most of the pubs around here are all dog friendly. Look at this, a little, little barrel there so that they can uh, drink plenty of water. It's really nice with these little alcoves as well. And I can see, yes, this is definitely the largest of the beer gardens that I've seen so far on our travels around Barnes. And it's really nice, it goes down further down there, don't want to disturb those people. Uh, lots of flies, aren't there? Lots of little midges. Lots of midges. Uh, let's, have a, let's have a quick walk through the pub and uh, check out the next place. Ah, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm all right. I'll just pop in for a sec. Hang on. 
true. Yeah. And is it the largest? Is it the largest beer garden in Barnes? So here. Yeah, the, yeah. At the moment it is. Yeah. yeah it's, um, Fantastic. That's great. Do you have music here as well? Live music, uh, rarely, but we we do it for special events here. Special so events. Check out the fireplace. Oh wow, yeah, nice. fireplace. Oh, proper fire. That's what you yeah. like to see. Brilliant, lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah, Cheers. Nice you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. They were friendly, weren't they? They were really friendly. Uh, I tell you what, um, if uh, if they're that friendly, then I don't mind paying a bit extra for a hot dog or a burger because um, that um, that actually. You know, there's nothing like paying lots of money and you've got surly staff. They were absolutely delightful. And they don't know who, they, who we were, but they just welcomed us in and said, take a look around. Lovely people, like most people that we've met. In fact, like all the people we've met so far um, on our travels around Barnes. And we've still got Mort Lake to come. That'll be the next episode. Uh, let's have a quick look, see where's well, another couple of pubs coming up. One, one beauty uh, just coming up around the corner. Yeah, look, look at these little lanes everywhere as well. It's really cute, and these independent shops and and stuff. As I said, um, there is uh, there are more independent shops here than anywhere else in the whole of the country. Unfor yes, unfortunately, here we do have a chain, Sainsbury's, um, but here we are approaching Barnes Green. And this, I just hope the light is going to be good enough to do this justice, because this is just picture postcard loveliness. Uh, let's uh, check out Barnes Green. It's got a, it's got a lovely little pond. Here we go. It's called the Sun. Lovely pub. It's a pub that you think of when you think of Barnes. You think of the Sun, the Sun Inn. Um, this actually is a chain. Pub, I believe, but it's a it's a chain pub with lots of. Uh, look at this! Look at that, Essex Lodge. That's a that's a bed and breakfast, believe it or not. Amazing, beautiful place. Um, but the Sun Inn, this pub has some very interesting previous drinkers. Now uh, we've done a bit of a circle uh, because right down that road you've got Olympic Studios, just down there, just a short walk away. And it is in the sun where, after the Beatles would uh, do their work on All You... Which one was it? All you need is love! Da, 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 da. They would go for a drink in there, in the Sun Inn. Uh, so that has had the Fab Four drinking a few Fab pints in there. And uh, who could blame them? Isn't this a cute place? I know, it's, it's just so beautiful, isn't it? Look at that, that's a, that's a bed and breakfast. Yeah. At Essex Lodge. Yeah. And check out check out the pond over here. Hopefully the light is good enough. What are we looking at here? Just the is pond. This? this is just the pond. This is, this is Barnes Green. Right. Uh, absolutely lovely. As you can see here. Right. Open to everyone. The focal point of Barnes Village is a green and pond. Uh, this building over here, this lovely old building, that's actually the oldest house still standing uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, in, in Barnes. That is where the novelist and essayist Henry Fielding uh, used to live. Uh, believe it or not. Um, and now his, fa his most famous work is probably his 1749 picaresque comic novel, The History of Tom Jones, A Foundling. And I'm pretty sure that uh, Fielding would have sat in the sun over there writing some of his work. Um, though actually I have a feeling that at the time when he was living there, this that was actually a coffee bar rather than a, a pub. Uh, it was a drinking establishment, more coffee than, than beer, but um, well, that, I'm... That was also frowned upon back then, yeah. occasionally. The house dates back from the 16th century, um, but there was actually a house there in the 1400s. And obviously there, is, there were some foundations there from the original 1400s house. Um, but that house, that house itself is from the 1600s. Believe it or not, that almost got demolished. 
Um, they, they, they almost pulled it down in 1945, but there was an absolute outcry um, and it was saved. So thank goodness, because that, that is the oldest the oldest house in Barn still standing. And it's absolutely beautiful. Anyway, let's have a very quick look inside the Sun Inn before we see the sun go in. That pub, the Sun Inn, dates back to the 1700s. It's great to list it and the beer garden is also very, very popular. It's not the cheapest to eat and drink in, but uh, you'd expect that really. But the Sunday roast is apparently, according to the reviews, the Sunday roast is amazing. Uh, let's just stick our head in. Let's have a quick look. Oh, this is charming, isn't it? Look at that, you can imagine, you can imagine the Beatles in here, can't you? you can imagine John and Ringo and Paul and... It's been all built, it's been and all built. George, you can imagine them sitting in here and having a few drinks. And here's a garden terrace. And there we go, look at that. Here it is. This is the garden terrace. And... Back here, we have the bowling club, Barnes Bowling Club. I mean, how more of a village can you possibly get a bowling club? You missed. So this is a good place to end, end this episode. Okay. And as the, uh, as the Beatles said, um, after they, uh, as you know, the Beatles uh, did uh, All You Need Is Love, well, actually, we can go one further. All you need is love, your London. So make sure you subscribe. Make sure you enjoy uh, these all our videos. We've done so many, and we want to do so many more. So we really need you to subscribe and to promote and to help to, to help share our videos. You know, just do all those things that we need. All those little things are coming up on the, on your screen now. You know what to do by now. Just help us. Help us. We're desperate. Okay. So uh, so next time we're going to be around the starting at Barnes Bridge and making our way to Mortlake Station, which is of course the end of the boat race course. Uh, but until um, next, next time. time bye. bye. Yeah. <laughs> next time on Love Your London. Well, patrons will be getting a special episode of their own as we show extended footage of our leisurely walk around the London Wetland Centre that we mentioned at the beginning of this episode. To become a patron, just check out the link in the description below. But for everyone else, in the next episode we will be talking about Barnes Bridge and the White Hart Pub. We'll be telling you about the importance of both tapestry and pottery to the local area. We'll be talking about the fascinating explorer Sir Richard Burton, who is buried in the grounds of St Mary Magdalene Roman Catholic Church. We'll be visiting, of course, Mortlake Station, the Stag Brewery, and much, much more. Till next time! From Acton Town to Wimbledon, from Brixton to beyond, love your London, have a banana.